God's faith. How long have we spent in Galatians? I hope we're still discovering day by day what faith is. It's faith. Okay, my friends, gather round and I will tell you a story. <coughs> a story given us by God, the people of London. The kids at Lansal were teasing me on Wednesday night for my storytelling. They loved it, though, didn't they? <laughs> Remember the story of Jesus in the badlands of Tyre and Sidon? Jesus withdrawing from his busy ministry in Matthew 15 into the badlands of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were a bad place. It was like being in Dakar and Senegal, cowboy country. Or maybe in Kaliningrad on the Baltic coast. It was a bad, bad place to be. Jesus went off into the badlands and up, up came a woman who was an outcast. A woman in the first place, no Jewish rabbi is going to have anything to do with a woman in terms of his teaching, his preaching and so on. The women were doing the cooking, you know, just those guys had it down, didn't they? A woman was there doing the cooking and, and just being, you know, in the Shadowlands. Worse than that, this woman was a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman. So a woman from a, a bad background, a woman from a, a background and upbringing, paganism, immorality, and idolatry. Came that woman, more than that, that was from that vicinity, that vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. Well, idolatry and immorality lurked on every street corner. And this woman started crying out, and she didn't stop. She kept on crying out. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. And each one of us would have turned around and said, you take your kids into all that sort of mess and you get, you get what you expect. You expose your kids to that sort of stuff. You let them go there. And what's going to happen? It's your own fault. And it was your own fault. And she kept on and on crying out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demonization. And Jesus blanked. He didn't answer her a word. And on and on it went. And in their embarrassment at the end of the day, the disciples, I mean the PR wasn't good, the disciples went to Jesus and they urged him and they said, send her away, she keeps crying out after us. He said, yeah, no, she's on our hero here. It doesn't look good. Get rid of this woman. Jesus just blanked her. And he turned to his disciples and he said to his disciples, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Remember that phrase? I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And whether the woman saw or not, I have no idea, but she came and she knelt before him. She can no longer be ignored. Lord, help me. Help me. She said. And Jesus replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The woman has been ignored and now she's been knocked back. Ignored and knocked back. And one of the dogs. And most people in their right mind would have thought, you're a cheeky rat, I'm not having the preacher speak to me like that, I'm off. Right? No, no, no. Yes, Lord, she said. That's right. Count me as one of the dogs. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Ignored and knocked back, insulted actually quite badly. Yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. What a faithful response. What a faithful response. And Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very moment. So is Jesus now being inconsistent? He was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Is he exceeding his commission, his mission from God? Because he's still only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, however much he's gone on at him. From Abraham onwards, Israel is defined as the people that trust in Israel's God. Can you see where Paul's theology in Galatians is coming from? And with absolute sinless consistency, the Lord now turns to this woman and proved herself to be of the Israel of God. She is amongst those who, against the odds, ignored, knocked back and insulted, persists in seeking to put her trust in Israel's God. Faith persists when it seems to be ignored. Faith persists when it seems to be not bad. And faithful persistence in adverse circumstances is what makes you part of the Israel of God. The people of God that he blesses. Seeing the favour and the mercy of God. What's faith? I could give you a systematic theological explanation, a clear logic chopping formulation, which probably owes more in its origins to the rationalistic enlightenment than it does to biblical theology. Jesus paints a picture. Faith perseveres in trusting in God when it seems to be ignored not back, but badly treated. It's faith. And in that case, in Matthew 15, it's seen in a hopeless case, in a bad place, in a person that most would look down on and despise and reject. Abel's faithful sacrifice. What is faith? Faith in Hebrews 13, 1, is being sure of what we hope for. That woman was sure. She was going to get Sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. She was not back. She was ignored. She was <coughs> insulted. But she knew it was true of her. She persisted with God. Abel's faithful sacrifice. God commends faith. What is faith? Sure of what we hope for, certainly what we do not see. You have a memory verse this week? Memory verses are good because they pin things in our heads. It's a good one. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. And that's what the ancients were commended for. Being sure of what we hope for, what we haven't got what's to come. Certain of what we can't see. Faith is definite. Definite. It's definite about the intangible. It's what we hope for. It's not what we got. It's what we don't see, not what we can. Definite about the intangible. And then the writer of Hebrews gives us it for instance. Creation. This will be controversial. Is our faith in creation dependent on arguments about the fossil record? Is it dependent on taking on rationalistic science with all its epistemological errors and just accepting them and bashing through on the basis of what science can tell us to say God made everything and there's no link to the fossil record and all that and God bless all those who do okay? God bless them but may bless them more because it can be a horrible distraction Hebrews is saying by faith we know that God made all that is 
The universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It's a creatio ex nihilo, if you must have theological Latin. But the point is that we understand this by faith, not by sight. It makes sense, and God says. Theater, for instance, creation. By faith we understand the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. And that is historic, biblical spirituality. Because that is what the ancients were commended for. You see it in the case of Cain and Abel, which we looked at just now. You see it in the case of that Cain-like woman from a bad background, with a bad history, with little going for her in terms of acceptance with the religious people of her day. It's historic. Biblical spirituality. Faith is the evidence of what we hope for. Certainty of what we can't see. Against the odds. Ignored, knocked back, and insulted. Persevering in leaning on God. crucial thing we didn't spend enough time dwelling on as we worked our way recently through Galatians is this, living by faith, not by ritual law, is the essence of both, both Old Testament and New Testament God-pleasing life. The bulk of the rest of the chapter, Hebrews 13, is, is taken up with uh, the illustration of that fact from the people of long ago, showing this is historic, biblical spirituality. It's crucial for the Hebrews receiving this letter, much more so than for the Galatians, because the Hebrews are Hebrews. The Galatians have been godless. For the Galatians, there was no background in spiritual things. Celtic tribes people. The Hebrews were Hebrews. And they had religion in spades. And the tendency to rely on what you can see and do, emotions that you can go through, is right through their background. And so they come to Christ and they've got this baggage of religion. Now I'm sure the Celtic tribes have like baggage of their own, okay? Goodness knows what their baggage was and I don't want to know. Paganism and who knows what. But these Jewish people have a background in religiosity from which they need to be delivered into faith as much as those Celtic tribes will need to be delivered into faith themselves from whatever was played in them before. They were of Jewish extraction, and secondly, the people receiving this letter to the Hebrews had come from second generation Christianity. Do you know what that is? It's where mum and dad were converted gloriously out of a, you know, a, a rotten background, and it's crystal clear for them. But these kids have grown up in, I don't know, the manse? Or the Christian home? And they've taken in the language of Zion with their mothers and men. So it's crucial that you get to see the point that this is what the ancients were commended for. Abel, Enoch, Noah, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, Moses' parents, Moses himself. Somebody said recently to me, Moses is a guy, he started out life as a basket case. <laughs> Rahab the harlot, what a woman she must have been. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, who quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. How of faith? Against the odds. Against what they could see. Who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Faith. In the face of loss. Rejection. Apparent failure. And some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world wasn't worthy of them. And just like our brethren, perhaps, 
in other lands today. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. And these were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. See that? These faithful people were far from perfect people. These faithful people were commended against the flow of their own righteousness. But their faith is what commended them to God. The crucial thing. The crucial thing is that they persevered when they were ignored or felt like it. They persevered in trusting God when they were not back. Sold in two? That would put you off your breakfast, wouldn't it? That sort of prospect. They persevered in trusting God. Most of you hasn't got to that yet in Sunday. Shall I say No, no, no. Can you see the point? Living by faith, not by ritual, not by law. The essence of the whole deal. Dane Altman in his Twitter account recently, Dane Altman's well-known um, American theologian. Luther's theology of the Christian life boiled down to two steps. Number one, trust in Christ. Number two, see number one. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? Now the bulk of the rest of this chapter is taken up with the illustration of that. 